Well, welcome back to part three of Speech 101. So just before the break, I was talking about phonetics. Uh, and so in particular, acoustic phonetics and articulatory phonetics, which is the physiophonic aspect of speech. We're now going to move, move to the psychophonic aspects, and this is known as phonology. So this is how speech is actually used in practice. So the phonetic description that I gave before is language independent. Um, those symbols can be applied to any any language, any sound that emerges from somebody's mouth. But I also implied that um, any any given language is it uses as a subset of sounds from that complete set. Now this is not strictly true. In practice, all sounds, any sound, can occur in any language. What really matters is how those sounds are used to distinguish meanings. And what that means is that certain sounds contrast and distinguish one word from another. And it turns out that native listeners only perceive the differences between sounds which have that contrastive behaviour. In other words, a native listener cannot hear the difference between sounds which end up not making a difference between words, uh, between one word and another, in their given language. So this is quite a confusing concept, but it is a perceptual phenomenon and seems to be a rather crucial part of the way that speech is organised in the brain. So this is indeed the psychophonic phenomenon that uh, early phoneticians uh, uh, observed right from the start. So what does this mean? Well, for the, the, these contrastive phones, have a, 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 which are in a particular language, are call, have a special name, and they're called phonemes. Okay, And the phonemic inventory of a language is found by exploring minimal pairs. So these are words which are only distinguished by one phone. Uh, so I don't have, I'm not going to go into huge detail here, but just to give you an example. Um, so in English, there are two words, fussy and fuzzy, um, that you can hear that they're minimally distinct. The difference is, is that there is a, a voiced and voiceless fricative. So it's s versus z. And that means that s in English must be a phoneme and z must be a phoneme in English as well. OK, uh, whereas in French we have uh, chou versus ju, which means that ch and je must be phonemes in French, um, as they are in English uh, as well, and many other languages. But that just demonstrates that they also exist in French, which means that a French native speaker will perceive those sounds as different. Um, in Italian, we have the words for fate and done. Uh, so we've got fato versus fatto. Now, to an English ear, they just sound, those two uh, alveolar stops sound like T. But in fact, there's a, there is a subtle phonetic difference. And to an Italian ear, that is a very clear distinction. And to an English ear, uh, it's not even noticeable. And the reason it's noticeable to an Italian is because it is used to distinguish one word from another. So, those two variants of the t sound are phonemes in Italian. Likewise, in, in Spanish, <coughs> the word for dog is uh, perro, and the word for butt is perro. And so we've got a difference between a trill and a flap, which, again, to an English ears and many other languages, are indistinguishable, or just not even, you don't even notice that they're different, but in Spanish, uh, they are. Okay, so uh, phonemes, that term is by definition language specific. It is not a language universal concept. So phonemes are written using IPA symbols and that is already a, a potential major cause of cause of confusion. So beware. What you're looking for is uh, to tell the difference between a phonetic transcription and a phonemic transcription is what do those symbols occur 
what, what context do those symbols occur in? If they're between square brackets, as as we saw in the previous uh, part, then that must mean they are that is a phonetic transcription, and it's a transcription of the phones, the actual sounds that are emerging from somebody's mouth. Whereas if the uh, phonetic symbols occur in sl between slashes, that is a, a symbolizes a phonemic transcription, a language specific phonemic transcription. It indicates the specific sounds that are perceived as different within the language. So this phonemic transcription, in, in some senses, it, it's not because it's uh, psychological. It's idealized. It's abstract. Whereas the phonetic transcription is tra uh, capturing the actual sounds used. So here's an example of a, a simple English phrase, uh, law and order. Um, so phonemically, that can be transcribed as law and order. But phonetically, as it actually emerges from somebody's mouth, it, uh, a particular instantiation might be law and order, law and order. OK, uh, so there is a difference between the abstract form and the physical reality. And this is uh, a source of huge confusions. And um, the term phoneme is often misunderstood and therefore often misused. And one thing to be very clear about is that the terms phone and phoneme, therefore, are not synonymous. They're not interchangeable. Um, if you want to be safe, always use the word phone to mean a speech sound. Phoneme is a special word and it refers to this psychological uh, component, an abstract representation of how speech is actually used in practice. So as some evidence of the misuse, um, I did some work with one of my students on uh, what, um, you know, some, an interspeech proceedings. And we found lots of examples, uh, which I'm not going to go into here, but you can look it up, uh, where people are totally misusing the word phoneme and completely confusing what uh, what they, the reality of a phoneme uh, with uh, what uh, people are just assuming that it is. So this is a really important point, getting uh, using the word phoneme correctly and understanding the difference between that and a phone is a crucial piece of knowledge to have in your understanding of speech. So um, what is the definition of the phoneme? Well, it was defined, uh, it's been defined a few, a few times, but this is Daniel Jones, one of the early uh, phoneticians at University College. Um, he defines it as a family of uttered sounds, that uh, those are segmental elements of speech, in a particular language which count for practical purposes as if they were one and the same. So the phones within a phoneme uh, category, as it were, are interchangeable, um, which is an interesting idea. And there's a term for that. So these are these uh, this set of phones which make up a given phoneme are known as allophones. OK, a technical word. Um, so in Japanese, uh, the phone or and the phone er are allophones of the phoneme or. L, if you like. And this is, uh, so you may be aware that um, Japanese uh, people speaking English have a lot of trouble with pronouncing um, L and R be precisely because in Japanese these are allophones and not phonemes. And what that means is that to the Japanese listener, these two, what appear to be very distinct sounds, to a Japanese listener, they sound the same. They can't hear the difference. Um, in English, um, so any native English speakers will be uh, completely unaware, I'm sure, that we have two different ways of pronouncing an L sound. Um, there is U and there is O. And it, uh, these are pronou pronounced with the tongue either far forwards or far back. Um, technically, it's referred to as a light L and a dark L. Um, and these occur in different words. But to an English ear, you, or we're only aware of the single phoneme, all. Um, there, so these two variants are allophones of, of all. In Spanish, d and the are allophones of d. And in US English, uh, an aspirated t and a flap are allophones of a t. 
So um, you can, these can be thought of as equivalence classes, which is um, a neat idea here. So, so what? Well, uh, we can explain a lot of behaviours in speech through um, how phonemic uh, processes are realised, phonological processes. And there, there are four phonological processes here which explain the relationship between the uh, sort of abstract, idealised version of words and phrases and how they are actually pronounced. So here we've got um, a, a simple phrase, can be, which phonemically it would be transcribed in full as can be, but when spoken might sound like can be, can be, with an M. Uh, so something weird has happened here. Um, so we've got the phonemic intention in the slashes, we've got the phonetic realisation in the square brackets, and what has happened, this is the phonological process, is that there's feature spreading. So the bilabiality of the burr sound has spread into the preceding nasal. This is known as assimilation. Um, and how is this allowed to happen? Well, because it doesn't matter. It has no, it's not changing the interpretation. Um, in fact, it's an efficiency, as we'll see in a moment. So assimilation is one for, for phonological process. Another one is elision. Um, this is very simply deletion of sounds. So the phrase, I don't know, phonemically, I don't know, but phonetically could be pronounced, I don't know, I don't know. And so several sounds have just simply gone missing there. They're, they're not realised, and yet phonemically and perceptually, what, what's uh, present is, I don't know. Um, so that's deleting sounds, elision. The next one is a penthesis. This is where a sound is inserted. Um, and uh, this often happens in order to smooth the uh, pronunciation. So in an English phrase like vanilla ice cream, which phonemically, as you can see, written there, but phonetically, it might be realised as vanilla ice cream. Vanilla ice cream, if I emphasise the, the linking R there. That's a penthesis. And then uh, a very common a phonological process is reduction, which is neutralising the vowel quality. So uh, a simple word like and in uh, normal speech is hardly ever pronounced and. It's normally pronounced and with a schwa vowel. And that happens a lot. Uh, vowels are often neutralised. So these are phonological processes which, ex which capture the relationship between the idealised uh, mental phonemic representation and the phonetic representation of the actual sounds that come out of people's mouths. Okay, so let's look at an example here. Um, so here's a, a, an orthographic transcription. Uh, do, you know, do you actually know any solicitors? And phonemically, that would be transcribed like this because it's between slashes. So here we have, do you actually know any solicitors? Notice how carefully I'm trying to pronounce that because I'm giving the full form, a phonetic realisation which, you know, is a close match to the phonemic representation. However, what uh, could come out of somebody's mouth is this. Do you actually know any solicitors? Do you actually know any solicitors? So clearly there's a, a lot of phonological processes have taken place here. That's the phonetic transcription, of course, because it's in square brackets. There is a relationship between the mental representation, the phonemic representation, and the phonetic realisation. And there have been a whole load of phonological processes here. There have been lots of elisions, lots of sounds have gone missing. There have been some assimilations, and even an apenthesis, and a reduction. So this is the difference between do you actually know any solicitors as a kind of mental representation and the physical do you actually know any solicitors? Do you actually know, know any solicitors? OK, um, so there is another um, effect here uh, caused by the, um, the, the psychophonic nature of phonemes is that you can perceive them even when they're not actually there. And in fact, we've just seen some examples. Um, so if I pick on the I don't know example, phonetically, what one hears might be, I don't know, I don't know. But phonemically, one is perceiving and, and hearing, I don't know. Okay? 
Um, and uh, a very early example to really prove the point here was some work by Richard Warren on what was called the phoneme respiration effect, where uh, if you actually cut out a piece of speech and replace it by another piece of speech, uh, by, by um, a noise or a cough, then listeners don't even notice. So I'm going to play you two sentences uh, of, of, of my own voice. Let me play you the first one. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And I'll just play that again. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So um, hopefully you recognise that. Indeed, I see that the speech recognizer recognised it as well, which is great. Um, and you heard two coughs, uh, I imagine, in the middle of that. But otherwise, you probably didn't think there was anything unusual. Well, now let me play you the actual speech, but without the coughs. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And I'll play that again. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So, in fact, there was complete silence. In fact, two sections of complete silence in that utterance. Um, and it's very noticeable when, when the silence is there. But if you put a noise or a cough, um, not only do you, uh, you don't notice, but you actually perceive the missing sounds. They're not there, but you perceive them. You hear them. Um, and in, interestingly, you can't, uh, the, the experiments that Richard Warren did also showed that people find it very difficult to localise the cough. They don't know where it's happened. So lots of interesting work, which basically just makes a very clear distinction between the physiophonic and the psychophonic. And that's why this word phoneme is so key and it's why it's so important to get it right. OK, so that's confirmation that phonemes are indeed a perceptual phenomenon. Okay, so let's move away from phonology and talk about prosody. So everything we've talked about so far um, is essentially described as segmental, the segmental properties of speech. Well, now we're going to go suprasegmental. In other words, uh, the properties of speech which span longer segments. Um, so prosody, what is it? Well, it's a way that speakers are able to signal the importance of the information. And it's a bit, uh, it allows things, words to be emphasised, it allows uh, meanings to be made unambiguous, and it's a bit like punctuation in text, and of course speech doesn't have punctuation. Uh, so prosody is a bit like punctuation, but there's much, much more to it than that, as we shall see. So, um, since it's suprasegmental, um, prosody spans several speech segments, several syllables, whole utterances, um, and there are a number of interesting behaviours, lexical stress, lexical tone, rhythmic stress and intonation. And all of this uh, is carried by the pitch of the voice, the timing and the loudness. OK, so these are the prime suprasegmental features. So here's an example of lexical stress. So this refers to the prominence of syllables in words. Um, and we've got two very, very similar words here as an example, written and return, written and return. Um, the difference is that phonetically they're almost identical, <clears throat> but they are very, they are distinguished <clears throat> in terms of the lexical stress. So written has a stress, an emphasis on the first syllable, whereas return has an emphasis or stress on the second syllable. And what you've got here is a plot of amplitude and uh, pitch display and so for the first part <coughs> excuse me which is written you could see that the first syllable is louder and that the main pitch movement is on that first syllable and then in the word return we've got the opposite in other words the second syllable is louder and longer and the main pitch movement is now on the second syllable so even though they're phonetically almost identical the difference between these two words is carried by lexical stress. In other words, the suprasegmental features of pitch, timing and amplitude. So that's lexical stress, but um, there's something called lexical tone, which um, a large number of languages in the world actually use those features we were just looking at to distinguish between one word and another. Um, and uh, modern standard Chinese is a really good example. They have four lexical tones, uh, high level, high rising, low falling, rising and high falling. And so these tones, um, which in English, you know, for example, in many other languages, you know, the pitch of the voice doesn't matter too much. But in, in um, 
uh, in, in pitch uh, languages which have lexical tone, they are actually used to distinguish one word from another. So here's a, uh, all the Chinese speakers that are watching this will uh, immediately recognize this very famous poem, um, the uh, lion-eating poet in the stone den. Um, we've got the Chinese characters on the left and the English transcription on the right. And uh, the rest of you are thinking, well, why is he showing this? Well, what is, uh, f why this poem is so famous will become apparent when I play somebody speaking it. 诗是诗是诗是诗是诗是诗是诗是诗是诗是诗是诗是诗是诗 so and so it goes on and what is very apparent there is we've actually got the exact phonetically the same syllable is being repeated over and over again the only thing that's changing is the tone these uh the um the pitch uh, contour on the syllables, which is changing the actual meanings of the words. Okay. So, um, stepping up a level now, uh, when we have pitch variation that uh, is not affecting the meanings of the words, but actually affecting the meaning of the entire utterance, this is what the, we refer to as intonation. Uh, so we've got two sentences here. Um, again, we've got amplitude and pitch displays. Uh, the first sentence is, it's cold. And the second sentence is, it's cold. Uh, so it's a difference between a sort of statement and a question. And you can very, see very clearly that in the first utterance, it's cold. We've got a falling pitch contour on, on the cold word, whereas in the question, it's cold. In fact, you can hear very clearly, we've got a pitch rise. So using pitch variation can quite dramatically change the sort of grammatical structure and interpretation of utterances. <clears throat> so we can move the uh, what's called the accent, the position of where the emphasis, this uh, international emphasis occurs, the international accent, around and completely change the meanings of uh, apparently identical sentences. Um, so... Here we've got four versions of this is my laptop. The first one, this is my laptop. The emphasis is on this. Then we've got this is my laptop. And then we have this is my laptop. And then we have this is my laptop. All meaning quite different things. Same uh, segmental features, but the suprasegmental features are changing and altering the meanings. So... Um, it's another contrast. It's a bit like the, the phonemic structure was a contrast in meaning at the word level. Now we've got contrast in meaning at the uh, utterance level. Um, so here, here are some examples of how it works. So um, if the utterance is, this is my laptop, the implication, the contrast, is that it's not your laptop. Um, in Jack Likes Fish, implies that somebody else doesn't. Jack likes fish implies that he doesn't hate them. And Jack likes fish implies that he likes fish but not something else, meat. So it's a meaning contrast that is being um, communicated through these international accents. Okay, so um, that was a quick run through prosody. Um, some of the things that I've introduced to you there are also captured on the IPA chart and we have symbols here to capture uh, lexical stress, international um, uh, tones and movements. Uh, they're all on the chart in this position. Okay, so now we move into the final phase when we want to talk about behaviour and what speech is really like with some really important points here about um, f features of speech which may not be immediately apparent but which matter hugely in our understanding of what people are doing. So first some simple things uh, which I, I, you probably already know. So speech is continuous. We saw this before. This is why are you early you owl. And um, what is very clear is that there are no 
obvious boundaries. I said this before when I was talking about phonetics. There's no obvious phonetic boundaries, but more importantly, there's no obvious word boundaries. I mean, where where is early? Uh, where is owl? It's uh, it's a beautiful, continuous um, uh, pr- behavior, and it is our perceptual apparatus which is deriving um, the objects, if we like, that are our present. So we have to be very clear that there are usually, I mean, it obviously is possible to make a gap between a, one word and another, but normally there it's a, a beautifully smooth, coherent pattern. Um, now, I've just said there's no gaps. Well, um, here's a, an utterance. We were away a year ago with a, 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 a very large and obvious gap towards the end there where we've got complete silence. But that, of course, is not between one word and another. That gap is the g, the uh, velar consonant, voiced velar, cons- uh, voiced, velar, uh, voiced velar consonant in uh, a go. Um, so if there are gaps, they could very well be within a word, not necessarily not between one word and another. Also, speech is incredibly variable. I mean, obviously, there are many, many different ways of speaking. We have many languages, thousands of languages in the world. There are estimated to be uh, up to you know, uh, 8,000 different languages. 6,000 plus languages are still li- living. But what's, what's also quite interesting is that... Um, some some uh, languages are spoken by very small populations. So first of all, we have a huge variation uh, um, of speaking. There are 8 billion people in the world and they all speak differently. And then we have um, half the world's languages going to be disappearing in, in the, before the next century. So that is a, something maybe to be concerned about. This is the distribution of uh, of the populations of speakers for the top 20 languages. <clears throat> and you can see that the graph um, distinguishes native from non-native uh, speakers. And so one thing that's immediately apparent is that although there are more uh, Chinese speakers in the world than um, any other um, in terms of speaking their native language, notice that <clears throat> English as a non-native language is the largest, um, most popular language in the world, but that most people speaking English aren't native, which has a a huge significance. So speech, as I say, is very variable. But so even within a given language, groups of individuals still speak differently. They use like or dialects and they use accents. So a dialect is when different words are employed. So obviously, if all the words were different, that would be a different language. But <clears throat> if only the, if there are just a few words which are, are different, then that is known as a dialect. An accent <clears throat> is when different sounds are being used. Um, and accents and dialects typically uh, uh, correspond to where people are living or the sort of social uh, differences that exist in societies. Um, and indeed, it's uh, in some countries, it's very uh, easy to determine where somebody comes from or what economic status they have simply from how they speak. Um, but even if you get go down to a, a smaller group of uh, individuals within a given language, accent, dialect group, we still have um, differences in the way that people speak. Uh, so there are interspeaker variations. So obviously young people speak differently from older people, a very young child. Uh, You can understand understand that just from the physiology. Uh, People's genders, their general physical characteristics, people with small vocal tracts will sound differently to people with very large vocal tracts. And then people have their own personal habits. Um, And then looking at individuals, even uh, one person um, will... Uh, alter their voice. They may alter their social habits depending on the on, on the social context. Uh, they they are also subject to physiological, psychological, and other factors. Um, if you have a cold and your nose is blocked, that is going to affect your voice. Um, if you're uh, if you've drunk too much, um, then all your motor behaviours will be affected and your speech will be similarly affected. 
So people um, can speak very differently. Just an individual can speak very differently. They can speak softly, loudly, quickly, slowly, clearly. You can mumble. You can be speak casually or formally. And you can do all this, um, if you like, as you go even midway through an utterance, you can make these kinds of changes. Now, the important thing to say here is this is not random. People aren't doing these things randomly. They're typically altering their uh, behaviours as a function of the communicative context. It's an adaptation. So speech is adaptive in very interesting ways. It's adaptive to the listener, to the task, to the cognitive load and to the environment. So let's look at these one after the other. So first of all, to the listener, who you are talking to can have a dramatic effect on how you speak. And the most uh, well-known example of this, of course, is, uh, is the way in which parents or caregivers talk to children. Um, so let's uh, hear an example of that, if you're not familiar with this. Um, I've got a recording here of, of um, a lady who she's going to be speaking to her friend. So she'll be speaking to an adult about a, a, a toy, a child's toy. Um, and then in the second recording you'll hear her talking to the child. And what you're listening for is the difference in her speaking style. Well, what um, about sheep? Well, you know, she really liked that sheep's uh, ear. That, that um, I think, fit into her mouth very well it, when she was playing with it. And uh, I thought she was gagging herself for a minute there, you know. <laughs> So there she was talking to her friend and now uh, talking to her child about the same sheep. Let's do the sheep. Let's do the sheep. Look at that. <gasps> yes. That little sheep has pink hooves and pink eyelids and a pink nose. So you can hopefully hear a dramatic difference in speaking there and that's an adaptation and this has been well studied obviously the pitch of the voice has gone up it's the voice quality is more breathy it's slower and this is all um, an adaptation to that particular uh, pair of interlocutors but the same thing happens when people are speaking to somebody who perhaps isn't native in their own language or if you're speaking to someone with a hearing difficulty even when people speak to animals they speak differently and uh, this is a I guess of quite some interest to most of you when you speak when people speak to machines they speak differently I've got a recording here of some work we did many years ago in my lab um, of a person calling into a uh, an automated um, uh, travel planning system the system wasn't in fact automated it was Wizard of Oz which meant that we were using a um, a real person as the system but we altered their voice to sound robotic and just listen to um, what the caller does in response to that robotic voice. Time would you like to start your journey? 9am. Would you like the shortest or quickest route? Shortest. So, for some strange reason, the, the person calling felt obliged to uh, mimic the monotonic voice of our agent. Um, a very interesting adaptation. So people adapt to the listener, they adapt to the task. So a casual conversation is very different from public speaking. Uh, uh, the cognitive load, what else you're doing at the time, has a, a direct impact. Any, any of you who are drivers will recognise a situation where you may be in a car with some friends and you're talking and then something happens um, and uh, that uh, affects everything to do with speech. You'll find it suddenly difficult to talk. Um, you might even go momentarily deaf to any conversation that's in the room um, as, as your brain reallocates uh, attention to the needs of what's going on outside. And we also adapt to the environment. So if it's noisy, then we speak up. Um, and if it's reverberant, then we might choose when we speak. Um, and there, of course, this has been very well studied. There's something called the Lombard effect, uh, published a long time ago, uh, which shows how people um, uh, alter their voices in, in response to environmental context. And it's very important, I think, here to say that a lot, a lot of people assume the Lombard effect is just speaking louder. 
it's it's much more interesting than that. It involves a kind of reorganization of the speech, um, uh, and people are hyper articulate, so they're speaking more clearly, which is a very interesting uh, concept. Um, which is one I one I want to uh, concentrate on just for a moment, because speech does take some effort, and we have choice over the amount of effort that we put in to uh, producing and indeed in listening. Uh, to speech. So this is a lovely example from a colleague of mine at Cambridge, Sarah Hawkins, professor of phonetics there, um, um, of a situation where uh, uh, somebody, you know, a couple here, and the, the woman asks, where's the newspaper? And the, the man uh, doesn't know. Uh, but he has a choice, right? Now, if, if uh, there was some, um, you know, workman uh, uh, drilling or something, making a huge amount of noise, he might shout the answer. Um, you know, I do not know to be sure that she gets the answer. Uh, but he has a whole range of choices here. I do not know. I don't know. I don't know. Don't know. Um, no, these are, of course, phonological variants. Um, but what he actually says, because this is a quiet, casual, familiar situation, so she says, where's the newspaper? And he says... Uh -huh. three nasal soirs uh -huh. and that's enough in that context okay it resolves any ambiguities and uh communication is succeeds so there's an efficiency here about speech um and that's why we have these phonological processes because speaking takes effort and we need to balance that uh, somehow we don't speak at full, we don't hyper articulate all the time. It would just be too tiring. So here are some examples. So fish and chips, it would normally be pronounced fish and chips. Temporary is normally pronounced temporary. Can be, can be. We get an assimilation there. Bread and butter, bread and butter. So this is just a, a being efficient. This is not sloppy speaking. This is a normal part of communicative behaviour. Um, and it's essentially to do with balancing the effort involved in speaking and the effort involved in li listening. And it's, it literally is a balance between speaking and listening. So this leads to a very interesting phenomenon, which is that speech is contrastive. And this really underpins why we have this uh, psychophonic structure and the phonemic structure. Because in signalling involves effort, large effort involves clear signals but uses more energy. And what we're targeting here is not to create the right signal. The target is a perception. When you're speaking, the target is inside somebody's, a listener's head. So we're not trying to create a particular signal. We're trying to create a particular perception, which means that optimization is over competing perceptions, not over competing signals. And this means that ultimately the purpose of speech is to create sufficient contrast at the highest level, which is at the pragmatic level. In other words, what you're trying to, what are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to do by speaking? That is the most important thing. That is what will be optimized. And that optimization at that pragmatic level will ripple down through all the other levels and has an impact ultimately on what comes out of your mouth. Okay, so this is uh, what's known as the pragmatics first approach to speech and language. And if you have not come across that before, then I, I uh, draw your attention to it. So, of course, um, as with any behaviour, there are obstacles to be overcome. And the obstacles are alternative in interpretations. And this is where the contrast comes in. Uh, and we saw that in the, prosody, the use of prosody. It's uh, distinguishing between what the listener might hear or might misperceive um, uh, 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 has an impact on how we then pronounce things. So this is huge implications, and it basically shows that speech is not some kind of absolute coded signalling system. It's much more interesting than that. OK, so that's all about variability, and, if, and variability essentially means that in an ideal world there wouldn't be variability. We'd like all things which are uh, 
the same to be the same, but they end up being different. But we've gone, fortunately, the other side of that coin is that there's also quite a lot of ambiguity. So the ambiguity is when we have signals we'd like to be different, end up actually being the same. So in English here, we've got a, we've got a bunch of what are called homophones. So these distinct lexic lexical items, so two, two, and two, or here and here, they, uh, there is no distinction between them phonetically um, uh, or even phonemically. It is only in context that that ambiguity can be uh, resolved. And so um, here in the UK, we've got a, a classic, everybody knows this, uh, a classic example of ambiguity in speech by a famous comedy duo um, of many years ago uh, known as the Two Ronnies. So let me just play this uh, sketch. Four candles. Four candles. Here you are. Four candles. No, four candles. Well, there you are. Four candles. No, four candles. <laughs> candles for forks. <laughs> So, in case you didn't get the ambiguity there, it was between fork handles and four candles. So, I just emphasised those two uh, the examples to show that it's possible to make a difference, but in normal man uh, speech, where you're managing the effort involved, they are almost, they are completely ambiguous. Um, somebody made a nice picture of fork handles, four candles. OK, so um, that was four candles versus four candles. Uh, here's a couple of other examples. Um, great ape versus great ape. Uh, law and order versus law and order. Well-known person. Uh, I saw this on a, on a sign actually outside Birmingham Airport. Joe is off his head versus Joe is off his head. So it's possible to make the difference. But in casual speech, um, it, if it's not important distinction, then they, they may be completely ambiguous. And then this is a famous one in, in, in uh, the speech technology field. This new display will recognise speech. Or this, this new display will recognise speech. OK. Now, um, if you've been paying attention to the news recently, you'll have seen this, which was a, um, a huge media attention. Um, some very ambiguous speech sounds, which uh, you would perceive differently depending on, on what you're looking at or even what you're thinking. So I'm going to play this. So this is um, what you're going to hear is some very distorted speech. There's a, there's a kind of uh, distorted sound lead in. Then you'll hear... Um, what sounds like a bit of speech and it will be perceived as either green needle or brainstorm now that's uh, those are very very different words well you can see those two words on the screen if when you're listening to the sounds you look at the green needle or indeed if you just think you're going to hear green needle you will hear a green needle whereas if you look at the red brainstorm or indeed just think you're going to hear brainstorm that's probably what you're going to hear here we go So you can find that online if you uh, want to listen to that uh, again, um, and hopefully you've got the effect. Uh, it can be quite a strong effect, but uh, it, it, it's very variable between individuals. So um, that just showed that um, uh, there, there, there are many aspects of perception here for speech. Another one is that uh, speech is not just acoustic, of course, it's also visual. Um, in this case, I'm talking about the movement of the lips. In fact, uh, you can gain about 12 dB signal to noise ratio from looking at somebody's lips. And that is a phenomenal amount. In fact, that can make the, the, the difference between speech being completely unintelligible in a noisy environment 
and intelligible. And of course, that you know, there's a lot of information on the lips, which is why people who are hearing impaired can lip read. Um, so speech is multimodal. But um, there's another interesting effect here, which is that um, although the information may be coming through different modes, we, we can assign different weights to them. So um, there's an effect known as the McGurk effect, where the acoustic, where the visual information can override the acoustic information. And what that means is that what you hear, just as we saw in the Green Needle Brainstorm, what you hear is influenced directly by what you see. So this is the uh, McGurk effect. Now, uh, you might need to go to the website to get the best effect here, but I'm going to try to play the video for you. Just trying to find my mouse. Right, so um, now what, we, what I'm just about to do is play a video um, and what I want you to do is uh, listen to, uh, look at the screen and uh, think what it is that you're hearing. Ba ba, ba ba, ba ba. And I'll do that again. Let's do it again. Ba ba, ba ba, ba ba. Now, most of you, I hope, will have heard da 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 something like that now what i want you to do is get it now is um, i'm going to play it again but don't look at the screen or shut your eyes and actually listen to the sounds the same sounds ba 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 okay now you might be completely surprised i'll do that again ba ba so look away ba 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 so what you're hearing now should be ba 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 ba, which is what the actual acoustics. But when you're looking at the screen, uh, the visual cues completely override the acoustic cues, and it it's not just that you sort of integrate at some high level. You actually hear a different sound, as in the brainstorm uh, green needle example. Okay, speech is also. Disfluent. We had examples of that right back at the beginning of the tutorial. They're not as well formed as written sentences. Written sentences, of course, are crafted in in, in non real time and uh, and maybe you know uh, refined. Whereas spoken utterances are, are generated on the fly. They're not normally prepared. And I'm giving many examples. I'm aware in this tutorial of disfluent speech. So we have false starts, repeats, ums and ers, overlaps, and I'll just play you again the examples we had from the uh, earlier part of the tutorial. With the chest slight, Sheffield accent. There's a false start. Yeah, yeah, less words, less words. Do you remember the repeat? But I, I, I remember, I... And, and then a sort of uh, ums and ers of a, of a particular kind from that particular, that speaker. Now, what is uh, maybe a bit surprising is that you think these are basically just mistakes, but in reality, they actually make it easier for listeners because they reveal um, what's going on in the planning. You're basically making explicit that you're having some difficulties deciding what to say, and that then uh, helps the listener, which is an interesting phenomenon. Of course, that's true for human listeners, not necessarily for machine listeners. So speech um, is, of course, spoken language, which means that utterances are meaningful. They're referential, so you can say, what is that? Um, or, you know, give it to me. They're indexical. Uh, they're structured. There's grammar, syntax. You know, the words don't occur in random orders. They're intentional. Uh, you're trying to do things with your utterances. You know, um, pass me a cup of tea. They're pragmatic. Pragmatics first, as I said. But there's much, much, much more to it. But also, speech is real time. Uh, it's continuous. It involves interaction between speakers normally, which means there's a kind of coupling between speaker and listener. Um, it's incremental. We don't uh, deliver entire utterances, perhaps. We maybe give only partial information and then somebody else chips in. It's synchronous. There are time, interesting timing relationships between speakers 
uh, when they're engaged in, in in coupled interaction. And indeed, uh, you know, there 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 are um, some interesting analyses of the way in which dialogues work, which show that they're much less like a sort of tennis match, just taking turns, passing information back and forth. It's much more like a um, it's like a three-legged race here, a coupled system where there's an intimate relationship between the different uh, ac activities that are taking place between different individuals. And indeed, um, there's, a, there's a really nice book here called um, Speaking Our Minds, which talks about just what, what, what spoken language is in this context. And uh, Tom uh, Scott Phillips here defines language as communicative behaviour which is founded on extensive, inferential, recursive mind reading. Um, a really interesting uh, idea here, which links not only the fact that uh, we need to draw attention if we're trying to interact with something else, with, with, with somebody else, we need to, you know, we need to actually direct our attention and we need to obtain attention. We need to infer what is going on uh, because we don't say everything that's necessary. We're, we're using a lot of mind reading, um, a lot of shared information between individuals in order to uh, communicate. And that shapes the nature of spoken language and the nature of the speech that emerges. So speech is much more than language as well. Uh, there it has extra linguistic information, breathing noises, lip smacks, all kinds of other things going on. But there's also, <laughs> and there's also what's called paralinguistic information. That's an example from the earlier recording of some laughter and not just a, not just a laugh, but some interconnected, coupled, synchronized um, laughing behavior between individuals. And this paralinguistic information is about individuality and personality, your attitude, emotion. It's a very rich set of behaviours which are overlaid on all other behaviours and, of course, therefore, are overlaid on speech. Um, here's an example of just, just how much emotion can overlay on speech and indeed interfere. This is Charlotte Green, who is um, a well-known continuity announcer uh, at the BBC here in the UK. Um, and she's just uh, uh, handing over to, uh, to another newsreader. But she's been reporting on um, a particular piece of news, which you'll see she finds amusing. And just listen to the effect of that amusement on her speech. American historians have discovered what they think is the earliest recording of the human voice, made on a device which scratched sound waves onto paper blackened by smoke. It was made in 1860, 17 years before Thomas Edison first demonstrated the gramophone, and featured an excerpt from a French song, Au Clair de la Lune. <laughs> The, the award-winning screenwriter Abby Mann has died at the age of 80. He won an Academy Award in 1961 for Judgment at Nuremberg. Abby, excuse me, sorry. Abby Mann also won several Emmys, including, including one in 1973 for a, for a film which featured a, a police detective called... The character on whom a long-running TV series was eventually based. It's ten minutes past eight. Fighting between sheer so, militias and Iraqi government forces is into its third day in the south of the country. So that was, um, uh, in some sense, rather unfortunate because she was trying to unannounce uh, 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 the death of that uh, person. But so you could see that she was completely, uh, in the end, completely overwhelmed by that emotion. And I also hope that it's quite possible when you were listening to that you were having a kind of sympathetic reaction and you also may have had momentary um, consequences for your breathing because of the empathy between one speaker and another so um, emotion is a really important aspect of human behavior uh, and it's also very important to distinguish between emotions that are felt and then emotions which are expressed. There's a lot of work on 
are on uh, expressed emotions, but they are not necessarily the same as the f the emotions which are felt. Charlotte Green was not attempting to express emotion. In fact, she was doing the exact opposite. She was trying to suppress her felt emotion. But that had vocal consequences because of the interlinking of the anatomy involved in laughing versus speaking. Speech is also situated and embodied. Utterances don't just exist in a vacuum. They are tied to a particular time. They occur at a particular location, environment. They're tied to individuals, both physically and psychologically. So talking about the fact that utterances are individual, uh, it's, it's uh, rather interesting to note that if you break the visual, vocal and behavioural coherence, the affordances of, uh, that uh, an individual provides, that can lead to something called the uncanny valley. In other words, if you have a, 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 a voice which doesn't seem to go with a particular individual or an artefact, that can cause problems. That's a very important uh, point. So dialogues um, emerge from uh, the relationships between individuals that are present. And you have to ask, what are they doing? What are, why, why does anybody speak to anybody else? I mean, obviously there are jobs to be done, the pragmatic aspects, but there are also social uh, um, relations to be regulated, and in some sense, and problem solving, particip participatory sense making. Um, and so, if you're interested in this, there's a great book here by uh, Di Paolo um, called Linguistic Bodies. Um, and there's a nice quote I've pulled out. Without the possibility of conflict and misunderstanding, there is no participatory scent making, making, no communication, and no reason for communications. So really asking the question, what is it? Why do we speak at all? What is driving the process of speaking? And then, more or less the last point, speech is, from a human point of view, it's learnt from small data, not big data, small data. Babies only have to hear a word once for it to become a usable part of their vocabulary. One shot learning. Now, a two year old um, obviously has been uh, exposed to quite a reasonable amount of speech, but it's only about a thousand hours. And a 10 year old who has a pretty, pretty much fully formed spoken language system has heard about 10,000 hours. So these are some interesting numbers to bear in mind. Um, in terms of what might be required to construct uh, a, the, the processes that are necessary to engage in spoken language interaction. But of course, what this is telling us is that spoken language speech must exploit huge priors, things like theory of mind, knowing a lot about the other person, um, what they're thinking and why they're saying what they're saying which might, might mean that unrestricted spoken language communication can only be achieved between one human being and another. OK, so last word. Speech. What is it? Well, from what I've just described, I hope you've got the idea that speech is amazing. And indeed, it is possibly the most sophisticated behaviour of the most complex organism in the known universe. Until an alien lands and tries to have a conversation with us, right now we don't know of anything more complex than the human brain and we don't know of any behaviour that the human brain is capable of achieving that is more sophisticated than spoken language. And so we shouldn't be surprised uh, that we're up against some uh, interesting and phenomenal challenges in trying to understand what speech and spoken language is all about. OK, so that's where I want to finish. Thank you very much. Um, we will be having a Q&A, I believe. Uh, but if you want to find out more, then some of this is on the ISCA website under the SCOOT um, initiative, which is an online training. And you can find a lot more useful introductions to speech 
um, on there. So thanks very much. <laughs>